Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God who lives with us now and forever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today, many Christian congregations celebrate the Feast of the Holy Trinity. Many of us struggle with finding a way to talk about the Holy Trinity, yet we profess to believe in our creeds. We call upon the Holy Trinity in worship and in praise. We sing hymns and paint pictures imagining the three persons of the Trinity and ponder one in three, three in one. Does the beginning of this sermon sound familiar? It should if you were here last year because it is exactly what I said last year on Trinity Sunday. You know, sometimes it's good to hear something again. We like to listen to the same song or album. We reread a book that we enjoy. We try and find the rom-com movie that we really liked and go back to that channel to see if it's playing again. We often order the same food when we go out to eat. Parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, around young children can also relate to youngsters wanting to watch the same movie over and over and over again. And darn it, if our minds can't let go of, let it go, let it go, <laughs> from Frozen. So an, en so an encore of last year's Trinity Sunday sermon would not be so unusual. Having said that, I am going to rerun some of what I said last year, but I'm going to expand a little bit more on the relationship we have with the Holy Spirit, being now that we are in that age. Tradition says St. Patrick used a clover or a shamrock to show how the three leaves are but one stem. Others have gone scientific and likened the Trinity to the chemical compound H2O. Almost all of us in elementary school remember that water has three stages. Liquid, water, solid, ice, vapor, steam. The same H2O compound. In the fourth century, there were some early contemplative church leaders and scholars in Cappadocia, that's in Turkey. And they were trying to describe and explain the outpouring of the grace and love that was proclaimed in the Bible. And they were trying to understand how to live as Jesus taught us. And they came up with the idea of the Holy Trinity. They pondered the relationship of God, Creator, Father, the Father of the Old Testament, God the Father that Jesus often spoke of. They pondered the scriptures where Jesus is named Son of God. And they pondered the glory of the Holy Spirit advocate that became manifest when Jesus was baptized and at Pentecost. Just as sometimes we struggle to understand something, and even when we do understand, have an epiphany, an inspired thought, language often is inadequate. And when it comes to communicate what it is that we want to share, we're at a loss. Those early church scholars came up with the notion of three persons in one God. The word they used, hypostasis. We translate that from the original Greek to person. And what they meant by person was a state of being, not an individual person. They saw the Trinity as an outpouring of love from the Father Creator to the Son, from the Son to the Spirit, and back to the Father. A self-emptying and eternally renewing love. Pure, unfolding, passionate, creating, breathing, 
loving flows of energy between the states of being that are one. A perfect love relationship. So where do we fit in all of this wonderfully mystical, spiritual, and sometimes head-scratching cosmic reality? Well, let us start at the beginning. God created humans in his image, in the divine image. God also said, see, I give you every seed-bearing plant all over the earth, and every tree has seed-bearing fruit on it will be your food. And all of the animals of the land, all the birds of the air, all the living creatures that crawl on the ground, I give all green plants of food. And so it happened. It's Genesis 1. I'm going to show how the progression of our knowledge and relationship with God has been played out in the three persons of the Holy Trinity. Think about the relationship of an infant and mother. Not only about the absolute dependence the growing infant in the womb has on the mother and the care provided when the child is born. The infant needs to be fed, bathed, clothed, <laughs> diapers changed, and held close and secure with fathers and other family members helping along the way. And let us be honest here, as, as cute as infants are, it's all about them, and, and it should be. But what they give back is that smile, that giggle, that gurgle, that love. Yet what parents give beyond what is physically needed to sustain life, what is the motivating factor for parent and is absolutely essential is love. So it's God, the creator's love relationship with infants. In the stories of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs and the matriarchs, God as father parent continues to provide the toddlers in supporting their growth, teaching them to feed themselves, helping them learn to walk, talk, to pray, share, to move past self-centeredness, to care about themselves and others. As I so often recall, my siblings' first words, and probably mine as well, they were mama, dada, more, and especially no. <laughs> God's creating love relationship with his toddlers. As we look at Exodus, we found the Ten Commandments. God as father parent helps the youngsters come more in their own, navigating the trials, tribulations, and joys of being a tween or a teenager. Begin to think critically, questioning, wanting independence, rebelling, yet wanting boundaries, even if they want to test those limits and go beyond. And finally, understanding that they have to accept the consequences of their choices, be they positive or negative. Can I have some money to buy that new game? Why can't I stay out with my friends? We just don't understand. I'm grounded. You are running, you are ruining my life. I won't do it again, I promise. You were right, Mom. Thanks, Dad, for helping me with my homework. How did you know I wanted tickets to that concert? You're the greatest. I love you. God's creator's love relationship with his teenagers. And then we have judges, kings, prophets, psalms, proverbs. God, as father parent, is ready and eager to be there for his children's early adult years. The apron strings are loosened. The moral compass has been shown and explained. A time for discovering the difference between independence and interdependence and to find out how they fit in the world. Boy, did I screw up. I will never do it again. I promise. 
Mom was right. I should have stayed away from that crowd. I think I'll call Dad and see if he can help me figure out how to fix the carburetor. I really need some extra cash, but I don't want to ask Dad for it. I'll have to call and thank Mom for the care package. My college roommate wants to thank her, too. God, the Creator's love relationship with his young adults. While they, while they were there, the days of her confinement were completed. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. What's a mother to do? Do I need to come down there? God the Father sent his son to help his now adult children to connect with what it really means to be God's children. Along the way, much has happened that has skewed the early lessons. Now Jesus, the word made flesh, Jesus, human and divine, is on the scene to bring understanding and reconciliation right from the source. To provide a mature knowledge of the love relationship between humans and God. Jesus gives us the two great commandments. He gives us the Our Father. He becomes the ultimate sacrifice, which means to make holy, again, humans who were created in the image of God. For us to finally get it, Jesus, the clear image, face of God. You mean it's not all about just me? Do I really need to love my enemies? Is it true that God and my neighbor is what it's all about? I must put others before me and consider the needs of everyone? I am part of a larger reality encompassing God and creation. God the creator and his son's love relationship with adults. But when he comes, however, being the spirit of truth, he will not speak on his own, but will speak only what he hears and what will tell you of things to come. In doing this, he will give glory to me because he has received from me what he will tell you. All that the Father has belongs to me, that is why I said what the Spirit will tell you is what he has received from me. Here we are today. As those disciples after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is with us and in us, in our midst, in the most quiet moments, and in the most active times, God is present with us. The Holy Spirit continues to provide the support, knowledge, wisdom, direction, and love flowing from the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is the breath of our souls that are the branches of Christ's vine, possible because of the Holy Spirit. We are here in this sanctuary and in our homes, worshiping as individuals, as a community, because of the Holy Spirit. God the Creator, His Son, and the Holy Spirit's love relationship with us now as maturing adults. Humanity's relationship with God as recorded in Scripture is a progression of our knowing God. It is a story of the unfolding and intimate relationship we have with God. The Creator Father creating us in love and breathing the spirit of life into our souls. God caring for us. God through His Son becoming one with us to physically touch us, teach us, heal us, and save us. And God the Holy Spirit now uniting us in that same self-emptying love found in the Holy Trinity. The perfect love relationship. 
the outpouring of love from the Father to the Son, from the Son to the Spirit, from the Spirit to the Father. Today's Gospel from Matthew often is used in sermons related to commission from Jesus to spread the good news, to bring to all nations, all humanity, into the knowledge of God's saving, merciful love through baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, in his farewell paragraph, he summarizes how to live with the Spirit, our relationship with God. After all, he had to write the second letter because the church in Corinth was acting in a manner that was inappropriate as they were experiencing the gifts of the Spirit. But we must be clear that the Holy Spirit is not exclusive to those who are baptized and followers of the good news, but it's free to act in the world created by God. There are plenty examples of the Spirit's actions in the Old Testament in the Bible. Our relationship with God in the centuries following the Ascension and Pentecost is now focused on the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In today's Gospel, Jesus said he will be with us until the end of the world. As we profess each week, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ is here, and Christ will come again. It is only through the Holy Spirit we can have the faith hope, and love to know God, Jesus, will be with us until the end of time. The Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters from the beginning in Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. When the paraclete comes, the Spirit of truth, who comes from the Father and whom I myself will send from the Father, will bear witness on my behalf. The Holy Spirit is with us and in us and around us, much as the wind that they have experienced in Pentecost and other places in Scripture. The Holy Spirit is not restricted and will not act and will act where he wills. He does not act when he, mu when he must, but when he wills. No decrees, no doctrines, no church practices can make the Holy Spirit act or not act at any given time. The Holy Spirit loves us, and dwells in us as individuals, as a baptized community of believers, as a people of God. The Holy Spirit unites us in that perfect love shared by the Trinity, a love that is freely given and freely accepted without condition, without jealousy, without owning, without boundaries, a love that responds to our needs and prayers to the Father through the Son perfect love that is free, that is with us, and at the same time beyond us. We cannot contain it, a love that dwells with us as a church and that dwells with humanity and the world as the Spirit wills. In John's Gospel, chapter 17, that all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. I pray that they may be one with us in the world and the world will believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be complete. So shall the world know that you sent me, and that you love me, and that you love them as you love me. We might remember the analogy of St. Patrick, 
or the scientific analogy of H2O. We might remember the idea of the three persons presented in Cappadocia as being a state of being, the flowing of energy love between them as we approach the Holy Trinity. But in the last analysis, I think we can trust the definition found in the first letter of John. God is love. And the Holy Trinity has always and will always love us first. And the flow of love we freely and humbly offer back to God through the Spirit living in us in the name of his Son is the very same elf-sempting love that makes our unity complete. Finally, just as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If you'll pray with me, please. Holy Trinity, one God, Father, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you now and ask that you hear our prayers. For all those in obedience to your will, Father God, serve others in the manner in which you have given them the gifts of the Holy Spirit and talents to be your eyes, ears, hands and feet in this world. Give them the strength, guidance, and resources to continue to provide loving service in your name. For those to whom you have guided us through your Son, our Savior, to provide your love, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, comfort, and grace as we respect, respectfully Give them what is needed for their health, well-being, and sustenance. In thanksgiving and praise for creating us in your image and calling us your daughters and sons and friends, may we always be grateful as we humbly walk with you. And fortified by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, we ask that you hear our prayers and praises both spoken and in our hearts this day as they are brought to you. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now if we'll take a moment of silence to look into our hearts and to allow the Holy Spirit to dwell therein. <clears throat> 